Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for, for coming on this um, uh, nice uh, evening. Um, I've been told that there's been an accident somewhere in town and traffic is gridlocked, so some people may be coming in um, at, at the back from time to time. Um, this is, as you will know, uh, one of the uh, anniversary uh, lectures we, we've commissioned for uh, to celebrate the college 50th anniversary. And I guess most of you know that, that the format is simple. We've invited um, members of the college uh, to reflect on uh, what has happened in their professional fields uh, over the period when the college has been in existence, in the half century since Wolfson started. Um, our lecturer tonight uh, is Professor Peter Weisberg. He's a, a fellow of the college and he's the medical director of the British Heart Foundation. He's also an honorary consultant cardiologist at Addenbrooke's. He graduated in medicine from the University of Birmingham in 1976. He trained as a clinical cardiologist before being appointed a lecturer in cardiovascular medicine at the University of Birmingham. Uh, he had two years as a medical research council traveling fellow in, uh, in, 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 um, at the Baker Medical Research Institute uh, in Melbourne. He was appointed to a British Heart Foundation Senior Research Fellowship at the University of Cambridge. In 1994, he was appointed as the British Heart Foundation Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Cambridge. His research interests have focused on vascular biology. His group has developed clinical imaging techniques to characterize atherosclerotic plaque composition in patients at risk of stroke. And in 2004, he became medical director of the British Heart Foundation which currently distributes about £100 million annually for cardiovascular research, prevention and care in the UK, which means that he's probably the most influential person in this field in the whole country, because he dispenses this kind of money. Uh, it's very nice to have him back um, to, to, uh, to, to lecture this evening. Um, Peter, thank you for coming. Here you go. Well, good evening, everybody, and John, thank you for that, uh, that, that kind introduction and for saying having him back, which implies I really don't get in here enough, and I don't, and I apologise, but, 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 but I'm here tonight. Um, so John has already given you my background, and, and I chose my title carefully, and I hope you don't mind if I indulge a little bit in, in repeating the British Heart Foundation story as I go through, because by happy circumstance, the British Heart Foundation... Uh, uh, is now about 54 years old. So the British Heart Foundation was born at pretty much the same time as Wolfson. And so the history of the Heart Foundation rather mirrors Wolfson's history and they, they run along in parallel. I was gonna tell you a bit about myself, but I won't now because John's done it all, other than to say clearly that the BHF things there in red are pointing out to you that, that, that not only am I employed by them now, but I've actually owe my career to them because they funded me from a relatively junior stage in my career right the way through to my time as Professor Ed Addenbrooks and, uh, uh, and now of course as their, their director. So, so I have a, a, a debt of gratitude to them as well. So I thought what I'd talk about today, not knowing quite how to pitch this talk uh, and knowing full well that for some I'll have pitched it too high, for others too low, and so I'll miss probably everybody, but I might catch some of you along the way. Uh, I thought I'd talk about things that people do know about, and that's heart attacks. And that's because, good Lord, that's my phone. I thought I'd turned it off. I do apologise. Um, I'll just ignore that and turn it off. Um, this is what's happened to deaths from coronary heart disease, CHD standing for coronary heart disease, over the time that uh, both Wolfson and the British Heart Foundation have been around. And it's normalised to a 100% in 1968. And what you'll see here is a phenomenal reduction in cardiovascular mortality in uh, uh, all age groups over that period of time. So we've seen a 70% reduction in deaths from coronary heart disease in the UK, which is quite remarkable. And it's, it's been a, a complete life changer for those of us who've been in this field. We started off being unable to do anything for patients. Now we can do an enormous amount for patients. And as you all know, patients are becoming 
older patients and yet older patients and we all have this burdening issue of living uh, long but not always healthy lives which is an issue for the health service to deal with but I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about that particularly today but over the over Wolfson's lifetime there has been a massive change in in coronary heart disease and you might say well that's job done but but it isn't um, but having before I say that um, it's not that this is a, a reduction in any one particular part of the community so uh, I know you can't read this at the back but the three lines are uh, the top one is I'm trying to get the point here the cardiovascular disease um, I'll go back the middle line here is coronary heart disease and the bottom line is stroke cardiovascular disease being the collective term for strokes and heart attacks and other vascular problems, but the others are minor. So everything has been moving in a downward trend. But the important thing on this slide is the number. We started off at phenomenally high rates. So that would have been about 850 uh, deaths uh, per 100,000 uh, patients per year. We started, we've had a phenomenal fall, but we're still down here having far, far, far too many deaths. The fall has been in all age groups, so in the younger, uh, younger men, younger women. By younger these days we mean under 75, so it applies just as much to over 75s as, uh, as below, and women, so it's across the board. Uh, but as I said, it's not job done because this is the position today, and I'm sorry you'll see one or two rather um, quaint slides I've got from, uh, from, from, uh, from the charity, the British Heart Foundation. This is the way we try and get the message across and that despite that, uh, that, that enormous level of improvement, there are still 440 people who will lose their lives today from cardiovascular disease. 480 will go into hospital with a heart attack and so on and so forth. Seven million people now living with heart disease because they're surviving the heart attacks that they would previously have died from. So the burden is huge. Coronary heart disease is still the single biggest killer um, if you think about it versus single cancers and other things like that. It's more common, it's a commoner cause of death in women than breast cancer, yet women are very worried about breast cancer, but I suspect most women in this room do not worry about coronary heart disease, but it is a major issue. Um, that's why we still need to exist as a, as a charity and we still need to raise money, but that's the end of the, the fundraising bit. Um, so what's caused this fall in coronary heart disease? Now, um, You'll all have your own views on this, and most of those views will be correct, and I'm going to go through some of those things, but I, I'm going to do them with a slight spin. Um, the, the predominant uh, features have been absolutely first-class epidemiology, knowing what the risk factors for heart disease are, and then trying to get people to do something about it. That's inevitably required social change, and I'm going to give you some examples of the social marketing that the Heart Foundation in particular has used over the years to try to nudge people into better behaviours. And then I'm going to finish up by talking, and it'll, it'll punctuate my talk all the way through, really, the, the, the issue of randomised clinical, uh, controlled clinical trials. Because when I was a lad in medicine, uh, one of the banes of our lives was going around ward rounds with, with consecutive consultants. And one consultant would go around everybody and say, write this person up for drug A, write this person up for drug B, write this person up for drug C. And then half an hour later, another consultant would come around and change all of those and say, I don't believe drug A works, give that one drug C, get that one drug B. And we'd be changing the charts all day. And it was all done on the basis of their, their belief of what was the right way to treat the patient. None of it evidence-based, a lot of it driven by huge intuition and intellect and, and, and experience, and so that counted for a large amount, but actually very little of it was grounded in hard evidence, and, and the world is different now, and it, we're in a much better place as a consequence of that. So what about this epidemiology? And, and you, can, you can reduce all of the cardiovascular epidemiology almost down to a single study which is still going, and this is a small town in North America called Framingham where a group of investigators decided that they would get the community together and get their permission to measure whatever they could think of measuring at the time and then follow them throughout their lifetimes. This has been now going for an awful long time, but they're still publishing papers at the rate of several a year on the cohort, which is now very elderly. A lot of them have died and they're into the next generation. And it's out of that study that we know that the major risk factors for coronary heart disease are age, male sex, unfortunately, but smoking, elevated blood pressure, 
elevated cholesterol levels, particularly the, uh, the we, we knew it was cholesterol, and we knew that from, from the Framingham studies. The Framingham study then went on much later on when biochemistry became more sophisticated and, and identified the component of cholesterol, which was doing the, doing the, uh, doing the damage, which is the low density lipoproteins, the risk diabetes causes, and in more recent years, the lack of exercise. So we've known for a long time, thanks to that one observational study, which has been repeated in various different guises all over the world, all coming up with the same answers, I should say. So this is strongly evidence-based that these are the risk factors. By risk factors, I mean they are, they are not the absolute cause. Everybody knows of somebody who's smoked 50 a day, every day of their life and still is at the age of 90. Um, but most people can't do that. And it obviously is a, a mixture of the way we are born, the genetic makeup we have and our ability to cope with these risk factors. But most of them cannot cope if we've got all of these risk factors without getting into trouble with heart disease. So what are the determinants that's made that big change in death rate over the years? And it's about 50-50. This is a study funded by the British Heart Foundation, uh, Mike Rayner's unit in, in, uh, in Oxford. And they concluded, having looked at all the data, that just over half of the decline in deaths from acute myocardial infarction heart attack, that is, during the 2000s in England, can be attributed to a decline in event rate, that's prevention in other words, and just less than half to improve survival at 30 days. So that's better treatment of the heart attacks. So both prevention of acute myocardial infarction and acute medical treatment have contributed to the decline in deaths from acute myocardial infarction over the past decade. So it's 50-50, we got better at treating, we got better at preventing. So how did we bring about some of that prevention? Um, you saw smoking there as a very potent cause of coronary heart disease. Uh, some of you may remember the, uh, uh, the adverts that the British Heart Foundation put out. This is the only time actually the BHF has taken money from government. Uh, the Department of Health and Government came to us, it was before my day there, to say we want to get an anti-smoking message out to the population but if we do it they won't believe us. But if you do it they will, so we'll give you the money and you come up with the ideas. And, and uh, they came up with the idea of this this very nasty, I'm trying to get the cursor here, the very nasty sticky cigarette. And I don't know if you remember, any, any of you saw it, uh, people smoking in a pub where it was just dripping goo that was sticking to their clothes and getting everywhere. It was a really good way of, of, of evoking this gumming up of the inside of the blood vessels that occurred. And not just because of that, but because of a lot of uh, uh, campaigns and general public awareness and public health, the prevalence of smoking for between, this is data from 1972 to 2008, that the, the upper line is men, the lower one is women, but they parallel each other, has gone from just around 50% of the population to just around 20%. And it is still falling in most sectors of the population, except in young women, where it does look as if it's starting to rise again. And that's something to, to worry about for the future. So that's great. We had the epidemiology saying that smoking was a risk factor. Uh, we managed to get the population to reduce smoking, but uh, as, I'll, as I'll say many times over, correlation is not necessarily cause and effect. Did that have an, uh, an impact? Well, it had an impact that we weren't expecting. And again, this is a study, and I'm afraid I'm going to do this a lot, uh, that was part funded by the British Heart Foundation. Three of the investigators here were directly funded by us. And they took the opportunity up in Scotland, when Scotland banned smoking in public places, to do some serious measurements uh, about the number of people having heart attacks in the period in the six months running up to that ban and the six months after that ban. And a really surprising figure came out. Firstly, heart attack rates dropped very quickly within days and weeks of the ban occurring, which I don't think any of us would have predicted. We all thought cigarette smoke caused atherosclerosis over a matter of decades. And if you stop smoking, a little like cancer, it's gonna take a while before that risk actually dissipates. Not the case. The, the, the drop in coronary heart disease uh, event rates dropped within weeks of the, the uh, and it's, it's been, uh, it happened in Ireland, it's happened all around the world where this has been measured. But the most telling statistic here is that a total of 60% of the decrease involved non-smokers. So that really did confirm that it was those, those of us who were passively smoking everybody else's cigarettes that were getting most of the harm from the cigarettes. The cigarette smokers gained by giving up as well, but not as much as the non-cigarette smoking population. So that really does confirm the notion that passive smoke was harmful and was causing heart attacks uh, uh, over a relatively, relatively short period of time. I don't think any of us would have, would have predicted that. And, and again, that's been repeated in other parts of the world. What about, what about diet? 
Again, the British Heart Foundation's way of trying to uh, show kids what they're doing when they eat a packet of crisps. And uh, uh, this was the equivalent of eating a few packets of crisps, just drinking gallons of vegetable oil, of cooking oil rather. And um, you can't see, I don't think, what these lines are, but the upper line here is uh, the consumption. I'm trying to get the pointer to work again. Yeah, so that's the com consumption of uh, butter over a period from 1961 through to 2008. Quite a dramatic fall, as you can see. That is the consumption of vegetable oil moving up. And that, interestingly, is the consumption of lard, which has dropped from uh, uh, 60 grams per person per week right the way down to virtually nothing. In fact, I suspect the only people still eating lard are those people who go to the Queen's Head at Newton where they still do lard, lard <laughs> sandwiches, uh, and I'm sure they will ever, ever continue to do so. Um, so there has been a big population change in dietary habits, which again have fed into the, sorry for the pun there, fed into what's going on. What about exercise? This is something that got us into trouble at the Heart Foundation. Um, so a WHO report came out saying that uh, all you needed to do was 30 minutes of exercise of any form every day to reduce your coronary heart disease risk. And that's been repeated in many other big studies. So you don't have to be a marathon runner. You don't have to go jogging. You just need to do a bit of, a bit of exercise to raise your heart up for 30 minutes. And we included in that taking the stairs, sex, gardening, swimming, walking. And, and, and uh, we handed these ideas over to an advertising agency. And they thought, well, they combine the swimming and the sex one, as, as shown here. Um, and, and that that caused a bit of a stir in the press. We got some adverse uh, comments. We got some positive comments. But we got a real, uh, a, a real boost. I think it was from the Daily Mail. It might have been the Mirror when, when they published this. And so this is a cartoon. And you can see this rather blousy lady lying here in her bed reading the, the, the British Heart Foundation statistics. And there's a poster across the road. And he's completely polexed. And she says, might one ask what strenuous exercise Mr. Casanova has planned for today's remaining 29 and a half minutes? <laughs> so we got more publicity from that than from anything else that, that, that we did, but it served to drive home, home, home the message. So exercise has been uh, as an important uh, factor and people do tend to take more exercise. Of course, with all of these things, uh, society has changed their behaviors uh, and, and it's the people in this room who've changed their behaviors, but this isn't where the burden of the disease lies. The burden of disease lies with the so lower socioeconomic uh, uh, groups in the hard-pressed parts of inner-city London, where, of course, the diet is appalling, they continue to smoke, and they have no opportunity to exercise or any desire to exercise even, because life is just too tough for all sorts of other reasons. But it isn't all good news, and this is another, uh, uh, another uh, study which we didn't have uh, involvement in. Uh, again, it was trying to identify what were the drivers for this fall in coronary heart disease that occurred in the UK. And they came out with similar, but not exactly the same data as the ones I just showed you from Oxford. Uh, this isn't an exact science, there's prediction in it, so, but it's, it's pleasing that it came out similar. So they put down 43% uh, of the reduction in, in event rate to better treatments, which I'll come on to in a minute, but 70% to, to, to better prevention. But and there was a big warning there, and it's a warning that continues uh, still today, and that is going in the opposite direction was this uh, ever-increasing trend to obesity, which we hear an awful lot about, uh, which is obviously a lot of it due to our diets, a lot of it due to lack of exercise in the population. And this is a problem, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, this, the, the, the pink and the grey are men and women, but I, even I can't hear, uh, read from here which is which. doesn't matter, they're all moving in the same direction, whether it be children, uh, whether, whether you're talking about the definition of just being overweight or whether being obese, it is rising very fast. This is the prevalence of obesity among adult males above the age of 16 over the last 40-odd uh, uh, years. Um, uh, showing exactly the same trends. And the reason why this is important is that obesity drives di diabetes. We know that. Um, that's irrefutable evidence. People don't tend to die from their diabetes. In other words, people rarely die of having too high a blood sugar. I'm looking at Owen Edwards here to making sure that he's nodding at the right time. Um, uh, but but uh, it, the diabetes isn't what kills them. It's the vascular disease they get as a consequence of their diabetes. And that's why this trend in obesity is such a big worry because having done such a lot of good work in reducing the mortality rates from coronary heart disease, there are a lot of people who are predicting that is going to start rising again through the next generation. And you'll have all 
heard the quote that the, the, it could be that the next generation is going to be the first generation for a long time to have a shorter lifespan than their parents. Uh, I think we're a long way off that yet, and, and all of these are predictions, um, but we've clearly got a problem that, that we need to deal with. And you may have heard the WHO data that were published uh, earlier this week or last week, um, predicting astronomical rates of um, obesity in the Western world, particularly in the UK, and particularly in Southern Ireland for some reason, I don't know why. Um, so it's a real problem, and these are data that, uh, uh, that came from the National Health Heart Forum. Again, they, 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 the minutiae don't matter, but the light blue on the right, uh, on the right is predictions for 2050 compared with the, 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 the darker blue on the extreme left, and the trends are all in the wrong direction. A big problem that we've got to deal with somehow. So, what can people in this room do about their risk of coronary heart disease? Um, you can't do much about your age and you can't do much about your gender. So it has to be about the other things. And for a long time, we have been rather obsessed with what's called the 10 year risk package. So if you go to your GP now and ask what your, what your risk is, uh, your GP will take your blood pressure, your cholesterol, family history, uh, your weight, and various other things, put it all into a computer program. And that will tell you what your risk is of having a serious coronary or, or cerebrovascular event over the next 10 years. And if you're over 2%, then your doctor will say, you qualify now for drugs to try to prevent you having that condition. Um, if you're below that, you won't qualify, although, um, uh, did I say 2%? Yes. I meant 20%, sorry. It's recently come down now to 10%. And, um, and that's driven not by uh, medical common sense necessarily, it's simply because 10% is now affordable. We can now afford to medicate more people in the population to prevent them getting heart disease because the drugs are cheaper now, they're all generic, whereas they weren't a few years ago. But the other nonsense in this, uh, and I don't mean to be particularly critical of it because it's a good idea, is that it's based on a 10-year prediction. And as I showed you, your risk of having a heart disease is driven predominantly by your age, which means that you inevitably reach an age, regardless of your, your other risk factor profiles, where you're going to be at relatively high risk of having a heart attack just because you're that age. On the other side of that coin, and probably more importantly, you can be a woman in your 30s or 40s with horrendous blood pressure, terrible cholesterol levels, constantly smoking and overweight, and your 10-year risk is still very low because women tend not to have coronary problems until after the menopause when they catch the men up very quickly. So the penny has now dropped that actually what we need to be talking about is lifetime risk. We need to be talking to people at a much younger age, trying to identify what their lifetime risk of heart disease is going to be if they continue along the same pathway, and then allowing them to try and do something about reducing that risk. And by that, I don't mean necessarily medicating everybody, but getting them to exercise, getting them to change their diets. And so there's, a, there's, a, a, there's an app out there now called the Heart Age Tool, which we jointly developed with, uh, with Public Health England and, and others. And it's on the NHS Choices website. I'm sorry this isn't legible. It's just a, a screen grab I, I used for, for the purposes. But I, I deliberately put into the, into the algorithm a 50-year-old man who was a smoker and overweight and had various other risk factors and asked the program to tell me what is that person's heart age? And the answer comes back, 67. This tool is a way of, of getting across the message that your heart may be older than your chronological age. And if you go to this website, you can play around with it and it'll tell you what happens if you increase your exercise, drop your weight, stop your smoking, drop your blood pressure, any, 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 any of the things that, that, that are appropriate to you. And you will see what effect that will have on your heart age and, it, and how long it will take you with a new behavior to get your heart age back in line with your chronological age. And actually, if you're really good, you can get it below your chronological age, which means you can die and your heart keeps going. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that point. And that was prevention. Uh, now I'm coming to the gory bits. So, so, so if anybody feeling a bit, a bit uh, uh, uncomfortable, please leave now. Um, so I need to go into a little bit of, of why heart attacks occur, how they occur. Uh, so that I can explain why the treatment's been so effective. And what effectively happens in a heart attack is that a coronary artery becomes blocked. As a consequence of that blockage, the bit of heart muscle that that artery feeds with oxygen starts to die. 
And your heart is just a muscular pump, and if the bit of muscle that you're relying on for your cardiac output starts to die, the pump's not going to work as well. And depending on how much of the, the heart muscle actually dies, then the rest of the heart can either cope with it or it can't. And so uh, on, on the bottom of this picture here, we have um, a, a heart from somebody who's had at least three heart attacks. This, this should be a nice donut of red meat, as it were, for the heart muscle, but actually this is all scar tissue from an old heart attack. There's a, oh, it keeps wanting to move on when I use this, the uh, uh, cursor. Uh, there's one that occurred probably a few days ago, and this one is probably the one that unfortunately caused this person to die and hasn't yet developed into quite so much. You can see there that there's an awful lot of white matter, that scar, and very little red meat which is muscle. This heart, even had he survived, would not be able to do its job. It would lead to heart failure, a condition where the heart isn't pumping blood around and means you're breathless, your ankles swell, a very miserable existence and a very poor outlook. So that's the long-term outcome of a heart attack and that's one of the things we're trying to avoid happening. The, 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 the most acute problem uh, is that as soon as the heart muscle becomes starved of oxygen, the electrical circuitry of the heart is at risk of going haywire. Your heart beats a bit like the, uh, uh, the Ever Ready battery bunny, um, or Duracell bunny, was it? I can't remember which one it was. Um, they keep going because the pacemaker keeps firing and the rest of the heart follows. There's a bit of an electrical current going through the heart. If the heart becomes started oxygen, parts of that heart become electrically irritable and start to fire off on their own and you get electrical chaos. And if you have electrical chaos, you have no decent heartbeat. And that uh, leads to what's called uh, a ventricular defibrillation and that is inevitable death unless you're resuscitated immediately. So there are two bad outcomes, if you like, that can occur as a consequence of having had a heart attack. Now, when I was uh, training uh, in, in medical school and as a young doctor, this is how we treated heart attacks. So that was the ward. The only piece of equipment we had was a massive great oscilloscope which sat on the end of the bed and broke down all too often, didn't tell us very much. We could give painkillers to the patient. We could use a defibrillator if that had that electrical instability, so that was, that was important. Uh, but by and large, it was hope, and it was 10 to 14 days in hospital, and we couldn't intervene to change the outcome of that heart attack at all. We just had to let it run its course. And some people got better, a lot didn't. And even those who got better because they'd been lying around in bed for 14 days, often then had a stroke because they developed blood clots on, on, on the scar that their heart had caused, and that caused them to have a stroke. So pretty, pretty bad outcome. So how did that change? Uh, I have to talk about my hero here. He is a British chef professor, a pathologist, Michael Davies, sadly dead now. And he was the person who did some exquisitely good work on coronary arteries. So here's a coronary artery as it should look, a nice clean tube, no roughening on the inside, that can allow blood to go through. This is a, an atherosclerotic, uh, atherosclerosis meaning basically lump of porridge, coronary artery, which you can see is very narrow because of this, this large chunk of fatty material sitting where it shouldn't be sitting here. And if that occurs halfway down a coronary artery, then it's going to at least reduce flow, if not stop it. And that can give rise to symptoms like angina, or it can be completely silent. It may just be there, not, not, not noticeable to the, to, to the patient. The defining discovery that Michael Davis made was that Heart attacks occur because one of these fatty deposits, and it doesn't have to be a big one, not one of those ones that might cause uh, symptoms of angina. This is a tiny one here that was full of fat at this point here. This, this bit, which protects the blood flowing down the middle here from this fatty material here, which is highly thrombogenic, it, it causes blood clots. The cap overlying it, uh, sorry, this cursor really doesn't want to work very well, but the cap overlying it here breaks. And when it breaks, a blood clot forms. And that blood clot gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually blocks flow completely. And that's why you have a heart attack. We'd known that blood clots were associated with heart attacks, but Michael Davis showed absolutely unequivocally that the blood clot formation was the cause of the heart attack. And that was in the, in the mid 80s. So this is how a heart attack occurs. You have a, 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 um, a, a small, often, very, often a very small lesion here, cracks open and you get a blood clot and you end up then with blockage. If you do an angiogram, this is the normal bit of the artery here. You can see at this point it's ragged because there's some narrowing in it there. It should carry on all the way down here. Sorry, it keeps moving forwards. Um, 
the artery should carry on all the way down here, but it's blocked at this point here by a blood clot. And the ECG is characteristic, and thankfully, I hope, I'm pretty sure, the ECG they're doing on Graham will not show this. Um, and that shows somebody who's in the throes of a heart attack. And the light went on, so it's all about blood clots. Now, we had drugs that can do things to blood clots. We had aspirin for a start, which we knew caused uh, uh, bleeding by, by preventing blood clots from occurring. And the drug companies were on the threshold of creating these fibrinolytic blood clotting drugs, but they didn't have any good reason for them. Uh, and it put a real stimulus behind them to create them. And so we started to give thrombolytic drugs and aspirin to patients coming in with heart attacks. But this is what we saw. So here's somebody who'd been treated in the good old fashioned way, a shot of diamorphine into the thigh because of the pain, then given the new treatment, they'd survive their heart attack, but they have this massive blood clot, a hematoma in their thigh, because of course, these drugs will dissolve blood clots wherever they happen to be. And you've just made a hole in somebody's thigh and made them bleed in the thigh. And our nurses, I remember this very clearly, I was in Birmingham in those days, the nurses saying, we're not gonna give this because some of these people have bled into their brains and had a hemorrhagic stroke. And all they saw were people being bruised, people having bleeds, people having strokes, and said, this stuff's poison. We're never gonna use this stuff on our patients. And that's why we have to have randomized controlled trials, because we have drugs out there that can produce harm, undoubtedly can produce benefit, and we need to be able to quantify what the balance is, whether the benefits outweigh the harms or vice versa. And it's worse still when the benefits are invisible and, and the harms are visible. So in, in, in the case of thrombolysis, we could never identify the person who was still alive and kicking because they'd had the thrombolytic drug, albeit they were now bruised, because we didn't know they were gonna die and they didn't know they were gonna die without it. We couldn't identify them. But all we could do was identify all the people who are having problems, the consequence of the drugs. Consequently, the natural reaction is to say this drug is bad. Why do we need randomized trials? It eliminates biases so that we don't have the consultant coming along saying, I believe drug A is better than drug B. The trial tells you whether drug A is better than drug B. And it's done in an unbiased way, taking by selecting out all of the things that can confuse things and making sure that the only thing that's different between one group of patients and the other is the treatment you're giving them. All the other things are the same. It facilitates blinding. The patient doesn't know what treatment they're getting. The doctor doesn't know what treatment they're getting. And that's really important because if you believe you're getting a drug that's going to do you harm, it's going to do you some harm. If the doctor believes the drug is going to do you harm, it's liable to do you harm because he'll tell you this drug could do you harm and you're going to feel bad or, uh, from, from the word go. And it allows you to use statistics appropriately by using probability theory. You start off on the assumption that drug A or treatment A is no better than drug B, and you're testing the null hypothesis. You're testing the assumption that one is no better than the other. And only if one becomes resoundingly better at a statistically important level do you say that treatment is more important than the other. So, Again, seeing the BHF praises, they funded a trial along with the Medical Research Council done by the uh, Oxford Group, two, two, two shareholders of the British Heart Foundation. They did a hugely important trial. This line here at the top shows you the death rate if you got no active treatment, placebo treatment. So the death rate was around 15% or 13%. Part of the group got aspirin and a dummy clot-busting drug. Another part of the group got, a, got the clot-busting drug and a dummy aspirin, and another group got neither, and another group got both. They didn't know what they were getting. The doctors didn't know what they were giving. It's all done. The packaging is done in such a way you can't tell. You can find out afterwards by breaking the code if it's essential to do that, but at the time you're doing the trial, you don't, uh, uh, you don't know. And this showed something none of us believe was the case, that if you gave aspirin alone, you, you reduce mortality by somewhere around 12%, I think it was. If you give streptokinase alone, the same. If you gave two, you got double the bang for the buck. And you reduce mortality substantially by giving both drugs together, despite the fact people were bruising and, and one in a hundred would have a stroke. So the net effect was overwhelmingly beneficial. It's bad news for the patient who gets the stroke. We still can't predict who that person might be. But at a population level, the evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of giving the drug. 
And this came out in the BMJ, written by two of my predecessors, Desmond Julian and Brian Pentecost at the uh, Bridge Heart Foundation, two of uh, previous medical directors. Doctors have a poor record of translating the findings of clinical trials into clinical practice. That is still true today. This isn't surprising when the benefits are marginal, but the benefits of thrombolytic treatment and aspirin are of such a magnitude that they may save thousands of lives in Britain within the next year only of course if they're given. The task of implementing these important advances is not for cardiologists or hospital doctors alone. General practice and administrators of National Health Service must also respond to the challenge, by which he meant, they meant, the treatment has to be given very quickly, which means the days when the GP said, I'm gonna give you some diamorphine and come and see how you are tomorrow, gone, the GP had to get there fast or better still, Say from the story, it sounds if you're having a heart attack, ring 999. That was something GPs were castigated for doing in years gone by, not doing your job properly, not going and assessing your patient. But if you thought somebody's having a heart attack, 999, a dose of aspirin as soon as the ambulance arrived, and straight into a, a hospital to be given thrombolysis. We've moved on now, of course, and rather than giving these clot-busting drugs that cause all these awful, uh, awful bruises, we now put in these, uh, these balloons to open up the blood vessel at the point where it's blocked, leave behind a little metal stent which keeps the vessel open, and that's now the standard practice. So how are heart attacks treated these days? by instantly getting the patient to call 999 and going straight into hospital. And again, back to our social marketing, this was an advert we put out a few years ago to try to stimulate people not to sit at home worrying and thinking about it, just call 999 and get in. And we have several instances of people who rang in and said, were it not for that advert, my husband or I would not be alive today because I sat there with chest pain, I rang the ambulance the second I'd, I, I realized what was going on and I collapsed before the ambulance arrived, but they resuscitated me. Only once did we have somebody who complained that uh, the ambulance staff laughed when they arrived at his house and found him sitting there with a belt round his chest. That was not the intention of the advert, but, but somebody did it. Uh, so how do we treat heart attacks today? <coughs> Call 999 immediately. An ambulance will arrive as quickly as that one did there. They're at their duty bound to get here within eight minutes of the call. They will not take somebody who they think is having a heart attack into Addenbrooke's hospital, as the nearest hospital, because it's not a heart attack centre. They'll take them straight to Papworth, where they'll go straight into a catheter lab, alive, kicking and conscious, as this lady is lying on the bed here. She'll have the procedure done under local anaesthetic from a tube put in the groin, and she'll be home either the next day or the day after. Unbelievably different from 50 years ago. And we'll also send her home with a, uh, 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 an armory, I'm afraid, of drugs, all of which have been shown in their own way in their own randomised clinical trials to show that they improve outcome for patients who've had a heart attack and reduce their risk of having a further heart attack. So this is what's contributed hugely to these better outcomes that we have uh, in, uh, in coronary heart disease. And of course, it's, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, this occurs wherever the health service can behave in this way, and it shows the, the reach of clinical trials done in one country to affect another. But the bit we've still got to do a lot with is the other side of this, uh, uh, of this diagram here, the electrical instability. It can occur within a split second of the onset of the heart attack or it may occur a day or two later. And if you survive the heart attack but have heart failure, you remain at lifelong risk of, of this occurring. And that's a cardiac arrest. It's often confused in, 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 the, in the public media. Uh, they often call a cardiac arrest heart attack and vice versa. A heart attack is somebody who gets the chest pain but doesn't collapse to the floor and conscious. A cardiac arrest is somebody who just goes out clonk, uh, um, sometimes with chest pain, sometimes not because they've got a, 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 a chaotic heart rhythm and they don't spontaneously recover when you lie them down just as, as Graham did there. So we have at least 30, we have more than 30,000, but these are ones that are witnessed where people know what had happened uh, when somebody goes, uh, collapses in the UK every year. Only one in 10 or less than one in 10 survive in this country. Whereas if you go to Norway, you stand a one in four chance of surviving a cardiac arrest. The other thing that we, we, we uh, took a while to, to understand is that most of these occur in the home, not in public places. So putting defibrillators in, in stations and colleges and places like that is a good idea, but actually these are occurring at home. So what do you need to do to keep somebody alive? You need to call for help because you can't do it on your own. We needed several people to, to, to assess somebody. You need to start cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I'm going to talk about that in just a sec. And you can go on for as long as it takes for the defibrillator to arrive. And as long as you do that well, and it's not hard, 
then that patient will stay alive long enough for the defibrillator to arrive and for the heart to be reset back to its normal rhythm and that patient then to be taken on to the emergency services. And I just thought I'd show you, some of you may have seen this in the, uh, uh, on, the, um, on the television when we put it out, but this was teaching people how relatively simple it is to do uh, CPR. There are times in life where being tough comes in handy. Say some geezer collapses in front of you, what do you do? We need a volunteer that ain't breathing. It's what I made earlier. First off, you call 999. Why not? Then, no kissing. You only kiss your missus on the lips. You push hard and fast here on the Sovereign to stay alive. Remember, call 999. Push hard and fast to stay alive. Hands only CPR. It's not as hard as it looks. That went viral in the staying, and, and, and a huge number of people called in uh, of golf courses, they, they now call it doing a vinny. That we, we've got video loops, uh, uh, sound loops of people ringing through to the ambulance service saying, "I'm on the 18th hole of such and such a golf course, and my mate's just fallen, uh, just just collapsed, and 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 my other mate is is doing a vinny on him." And you can hear you can hear them singing, staying alive in the background, and the ambulance service, and uh, and it works. Um, and, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the important things here, of course, is defibrillators now are not the great machines that, I, that, are, that are showing here on the left, but they are, and fortuitously I happen to have one with me, <laughs> they are just literally this. Occasionally you see these things locked in boxes saying, for expert use only. That is crass, that is ridiculous. These things are meant to be used by anybody who finds somebody who has collapsed. Um, very easy to use. The instructions, are, uh, it, it's self-explanatory. There's a voice in here that tells you exactly what to do. You cannot do any harm in this circumstance. You cannot make a dead person deader. You can bring them back and you can keep them going. So people shouldn't be scared of using these things. You shouldn't be scared of doing CPR. You don't have to do mouth to mouth. And so we, we, we mounted a big campaign called uh, Call Push Rescue for CPR to create a nation of lifesavers. And one of the things we're doing in the non-research aspects of things, we're distributing these kits. Uh, they're 20-minute self-training DVDs. You don't need an expert to show you what to do. You put the DVD in. The, the, the mannequins there, there are 10 in a pack, and they can be reused several times with, uh, with uh, appropriate disinfection. Uh, and uh, we, we, our plan is to put these out to all of our secondary schools, because Nor that's one of the reasons Norway have such a good a good record. Every kid in Norway is taught how to do this and once taught you never forget. You may never use it but you may. Um, and we're also distributing in the workplace and, and uh, there's one very well-known London bank uh, that decided that they would try to train 1600 of their staff over a 10-day period in London. They actually exceeded that and within four days two people on the day they were trained went out and resuscitated people uh, in the shopping, uh, shopping, uh, shopping mall. Uh, both patients survived to get to hospital. One's, one's now out of hospital, one is still in hospital. So it, re it really does work and it's simple. So I'm going to come back to, I'm going to speed up because it's been a long evening for various reasons, uh, randomized clinical trials and these visible harms versus invisible benefits. And I'm going to talk about statins. Um, and that's because there's nobody in, in, in the world, I think, who hasn't heard about them. And uh, this is the Daily Express predominantly, but it could be the Daily Mail, it, could, well, it usually is. It could be the Daily Mirror, it could be, a, there is something, that if you look at these, Statins are doing dreadful things all over. They're causing diabetes, they're health alert, Parkinson's, uh, new statins, bombshell, you name it, they're doing a lot of harm. Same paper, statins are safe. Proof of statins save your life. Statins new wonder drugs. Statins have no side effects. How statins beat breast, beat breast cancer. Statins halt Alzheimer's. So this is the sort of nonsense that's going out into the press daily. I mean, almost daily. It's been the bane of my life at the Heart Foundation having to respond to all of this stuff. And it's left people hopelessly confused about what's right and what's wrong with statins. So I hope to try to clarify the confusion. It's been compounded by the fact that it's not just the lay press that's doing this now. So the BMJ ran an article 
um, a few, about a year ago now. Should people at low risk of cardiovascular disease take a statin? Amongst the medical fraternity, there's no debate that if you're at high risk, you've had a heart attack or you're at very high risk of a heart attack, the benefits of statins far outweigh any possible harms. You should be taking a statin. The issue comes following the NICE guidance that came out uh, early in the year, which I misquoted earlier on, that says that if you're at a 10% risk, then you should be taking a statin to prevent a heart attack because that means actually medicating a vast number of people in the population and pretty much everybody over the age of 60 should be taking a statin on that basis. So the issue then becomes, are they as safe as people make out or is there a downside to taking statins? Bearing in mind, there's no such thing as a wholly safe drug. But this was wholly irresponsible. The BMJ put out one publication which, which um, completely misquoted another publication and it was it was combined with a an authoritative uh, uh, observation piece by uh, Asim Malhotra widely quoted by the popular press as being a world authority uh, interventional cardiology spe specialist registrar at Croydon Hospital is what, what he is and he said a recent real-world study of 150,000 patients, so big study, must be important, uh, who were taking statins showed unacceptable side effects, including myalgia, that's muscle aches, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal upset, sleep and memory disturbance, erectile dysfunction, and in 20% of the participants, was resulting in discontinuation of the drug. This is at massively at odds with major statin trials that report significant side effects of myopathy or muscle pain in only one in 10,000. Notice the subtle change of term there, myopathy. There's a difference between myopathy and myalgia. Myopathy is a very rare and quite dangerous breakdown of muscle uh, um, in the body happens about one in 100,000 patients per year taking a statin. It's real, but it's rare and it's recognizable. It is not what uh, uh, most people commonly think of as the side effects of statins. Actually, the, the real travesty in this is that the, the, the study that he was quoting there took people who, are say, who said they had side effects on statins, 20% of them said they had them, took them off the statin, swapped the statin around, started them off again, not letting them know they're back on it, and nearly all of them carried on happily. So they got straight back on a statin, didn't realize they were taking the same statin as the one before, and they had no complaints. And that is because observational uh, uh, studies such as this, regardless of their size, are not able to give you the information you really need. So the cholesterol story starts here. This is population cholesterol levels versus population uh, CHD deaths, and, that, and there's a very clear correlation. If the population, by and large, has high cholesterol levels, they have high coronary heart disease rates. If they have low cholesterol levels, they don't. Uh, and, the, and the one thing it really does tell you is we used to talk about people with a cholesterol level of 5.5 as being normal. Actually, if you compare it with Japan, Israel, and other places, we're not. We're not normal. It's crazy the way we decide what normal is. We take a bunch of people in a room like this, measure all your cholesterol levels, do the curve and say that's normal. Whereas you're all abnormal. We're all got far too high cholesterol level. If you look within populations at uh, cholesterol levels across uh, their risk, regardless of their age, you'll see here, doesn't matter how old you are, the higher your cholesterol, the higher your risk of having a coronary event. So this is population observational data. It's epidemiology I mentioned earlier. Can't necessarily imply cause and effect. So the cause and effect comes from these. These are the, the statin trials, and the group in Oxford have collected together all the data from all the statin trials that have been done around the world to pool their data. 26 of them involving 130,000 where statins have been compared with a dummy tablet, and then, importantly, five trials involving 40,000 patients where some people had very high dose statins or potent statins, some had weaker statins. Testing the question, is more better? The lower you get your cholesterol, the better it is for you. So what are the outcomes? Very complicated slide, this. All I really want to draw your attention to are these black blobs here. Basically, anything to the left of this line here says that the statin is better for you, and anything to the right says that the dummy tablet might have been better for you. So it doesn't matter what it is you're looking at, whether it's heart attacks, death from heart attacks, whether it's the need to undergo an angioplasty, whether it's a stroke, uh, any major vascular event, everything is well to the left of that line, except the hemorrhagic stroke one, where uh, I can't get the pointer to move to it, but you can see that arrow there. And the, the telling point about that arrow is that it goes across this line of identity, this single line in the middle, which means that it's, it's, it's a result we can't be certain of statistically. Everything to the left we can be pretty certain of. That one we're slightly worried about, and actually it turns out it's probably real. 
there is an increased risk of hemorrhagic strokes, albeit small, on a statin. That data, those data are really rock solid, they're hard, there are no confounders, there are no biases in those, they are telling you the truth about statins. So in, if I sum it up, whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever age you are, you're better off on the statin than not. What about the more versus less? So if you take relatively weak statins and get a 20%, uh, 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 one millimole reduction in your cholesterol, you get a 20% reduction in your risk. If you then take a, a, a stronger statin and you squeeze out more cholesterol reduction, then your risk of coronary disease goes lower. And so the combined evidence is, uh, so this is, this is sitting on top of the population data I showed you. So I told you that was observational. This is no longer observational. This is clinical trials. And it shows not only is it that if you have a low cholesterol versus a high cholesterol, you're at lower risk. It means if you started off with a high cholesterol and your drug takes you down to a low cholesterol, your risk goes down with it. This is cause and effect. This isn't just statistical correlation. But, and this is the truth behind statins at the moment, there are definite uh, side effects to statins. We've never denied it. And they've all come out of the randomized controlled trials. So myopathy, this very rare condition I've told you about, we've known about since we started using statins. Hemorrhagic stroke is the one that's taken a while to come out. Uh, it's it's only 0.05% of people taking it. Again, very tough for that person taking it though, so we always have to bear that in mind. And the other one was newly diagnosed diabetes, which is a real signal from statins. So if, if you're on a statin, you are at higher risk, slightly higher risk of getting uh, diabetes. Now what the evidence suggests is actually, it is those people who are heading for diabetes anyway. You are a year or so away from the diagnosis and the statin has just pushed that diagnosis forward a bit. Possibly because you've gone to your doctor because you're on a trial drug and they've picked it up at an earlier stage. Um, but, it, but, but it does seem to be a real phenomenon. But if you have type 2 diabetes, you're much better off on a statin than not because your risk is a cardiovascular risk and the benefits in that circumstance outweigh the harms. So the absolute risk reductions for major events, if you're in a high risk group, somewhere between 6 and 12 percent uh, fewer events if you take a statin. It's I say between 6 and 12 because it depends on the dose of statin you're on and the type of statin you're on. The lower the, the, lower the better, the lower your, your cholesterol gets, the more, the more benefit you get. And if you're in this so-called nice group, the, the, the 10 percent group, then the payoff is less. So it does, it does raise a slight problem because um, it means that if you take um, uh, a statin in that low risk group, then for over a five year period, for every thousand individuals taking that statin, there will be 11 fewer vascular events. Now that's great for them, that means they've been saved from a heart attack or stroke, but it is actually not a huge number and there's an awful lot of people there taking statins who may not get the benefit. And that shows the lack of subtlety we still have in our medication of patients. We have not yet got to the point of personalised medicine where we can target a drug to a person that we know is going to benefit from it and not give it to the person we don't. Uh, we're moving in that way, genetics is helping us, but it's still a long, long way off. Uh, the, the myopathy uh, is real and the diabetes is real, but as I said, you will still reduce overall more heart attacks and strokes by putting a stat somebody on a statin or not. And, and the gripe here is not that there is a de debate as to whether we should be giving people at 10% a statin or not, it is they're being misinformed about the data. They are very much safer and very much more effective than many well, no, a few very vociferous people would have you, would have you know. And again, that comes back to the, uh, the, the, the fact that randomized controlled trials get away from individual biases. So what about the, um, what are the weaknesses uh, of a randomized controlled trial that are thrown out? Um, the problem is they're based on a selected population. You have selected the people to go into that trial. They've had to volunteer to go into that trial. So it's not an all comers event. And of course, when you're, treating somebody with a drug that you know, let's say somebody has a long history of muscle problems and pains, we would not randomize that person to a statin trial because we know it's liable to get worse on a statin. So you don't put that person in, you, you exclude them from the trial. So it's an unselected population. And the conclusions therefore are only strictly speaking relevant to that population that you've looked at. Yet we tend then to generalize these, uh, the, the outcome of these studies to the whole population at large once they, once they, they get reported. Um, and they'll only answer the question you're asking. 
And often drug companies run these trials, they're often vilified for it, but they need to get their data to get their drug approved. So the only answer they want is, is this drug better than placebo or another drug? They're not too worried about the frills around the side, which the rest of us might be worried about, and do we get a few aches and pains as well? They want to get the data they need for regulatory purposes. So there's a problem there. And they may not identify the very rare, one in several hundred thousand uh, events, but, 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 but very important ones. So a fatal one in a hundred thousand event is unlikely to come out of a randomized control trial because there simply aren't enough people in the trial to pick that up. You need post-marketing surveillance for that. So what about the, the, the naysayers? So here's one BBC, um, uh, reported risks of statins, giving you numbers there. Looks impressive because they've got, uh, they've got numbers there. Julie Hipsley Cox is a well-recognized uh, uh, well uh, epidemiologist. So the first thing, her paper is based on only two and a half years of exposure to statins. All of the randomized trials are at least five years. And I'm picking out just one of these. They say on the basis of observation. So the way this study is done is they collect patients' notes in and they look at everybody who's on a statin and they look at all the patients who are not on the statin in the same practice of approximate equivalent age and they say, so what's happening more often in the statin group than the other? And they say, oh look, there are more cataracts in the people taking statins than not. But it may simply be that the people who have got cataracts have more cardiac disease and a higher risk, and that's why they've been put on a statin in the first place. But the observational study can't, can't identify that. So the only way you can test this is to do a randomized controlled trial, and this was actually had been done some years ago on simvastatin, 20,000 patients, five years of follow-up, showing the incidence of cataracts was identical on the statin to the placebo. So when you get rid of these biases and you really control for these things, these things aren't real. So what about observational data? Are they any good? Um, people say, rightly, they're based on real-world populations. In other words, nobody's been excluded because they might get into trouble with the drug. Um, and they may identify these unexpected but rare side effects. But they'll only provide a correlation. They will never tell you cause and effect. They cannot establish that. And unfortunately, they're all reported in the press, medical as well as lay press, as showing a cause and effect. And they're prone to bias and confounding. And as an illustrator, this is the sort of thing you might come up with. So you might measure something on the left here, doesn't matter, serum, rhubarb, and something on the right, which is heart attack. And you say, look, those lines are going down in parallel. Therefore, one must be causing the other, or the, or the two must be absolutely linked in some way biologically. This is quite a famous slide, and it's pairs of nesting storks and births, birth rates in Sweden. So if you want to believe that there's a correlation between uh, uh, that, that, nest, that storks have something to do with birth, then there's your data, there's your evidence, and the Daily, uh, Daily Express and the Mirror would run away with this and say storks cause births. So I'm coming to the end, you'll be pleased to hear. So I, I, I did put the word charitable view at the front, and I, I think you know why I did that, because, uh, because I work for a charity that's done a lot in this area. But I, I just wanted to impress upon you just how important our medical charities are in our, in our bioscience ecosystem. I was on the main panel A for the recent REF exercise, much beloved or hated of people in this room, I suspect. And this is looking at bioscience only. And as you can see, the top line here, which is the, the biggest funder, is UK charities, by far and away the biggest funders of bioscience in our universities. The one that's moving up reasonably quickly is this green line, again I can't get the cursor to move, here it is, this one, and that is UK government, by which we mean the National Institute of Health Research, the NHS, uh, the, the research limb of the NHS, which has certainly done a lot to bring research back into the NHS. Uh, so the, 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 we're unique in this country, in the extent to which we rely on our charities to prop up and support our medical sciences and our universities. This is, uh, this is the answer, who funds cardiovascular research? Sorry, the font's been corrupted at the top. And the answer is we fund more than 50% of all the research going on in the UK, uh, with the Medical Research Council, the NHS, and the Wellcome Trust and others making less than 50% of the rest. And I could have shown you an identical uh, slide for cancer, where Cancer Research UK is by far and away the biggest funder in the UK. The medical charities in this country are not the icing on the cake, we are the cake. It's the absolute foundation of what our universities rely on to do cardiovascular science. And I hope from some of the things I've told you, uh, you'll get the impression that, that there's some good coming out of this, because a lot of what I've showed you has come out of evidence gained. Uh, where do we get our money from? Uh, it's all from public donation. We take no government money, and we don't take, importantly, any money from the drug industry, because I have to spend 
spend too much of my life talking about drugs in the public domain. And the first thing that happens if I say to a journalist, actually statins aren't as bad as you say they are, they say, how much money have you received from AstraZeneca or uh, uh, Glaxo, whoever is the latest statin, statin producer? And the answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. And we spend the bulk of that money on research. And like all big organizations, you have to keep going through strategy reviews. We've just gone through a strategy review, and this is what our strategy looks like. We are a research funding organization, first and foremost. We're very interested in prevention. That's why it's there. We're interested, and I've shown you a bit about the, the survival. Uh, and we're very interested in supporting patients. We have a hubristic uh, uh, um, uh, mantra here being a world-class organization but since we make the definition of world-class we know we'll manage that one and we're going to listen to people and we're going to grow our income so I think this has been 50 really good years and I think uh, both uh, Wilson College and the BHF should be proud of their achievements thank you very much for listening